Oh, g'day, mate. 40 here. Is your penis racist? Believe me, this answer might shock you. And we're talking science here, guys. This is all, all peer reviewed. So, so don't think this is just something just tossed off. All right, this is peer reviewed, just like my first book, my magnum opus, A History of X, 100 Years in Sex and Film, peer reviewed by Dr. Vern Buller, historian and sexologist at the California State University at Northridge before Prometheus Books published it. Peer reviewed, all right? Now, this work, I, I, this, is, this is academic, this is scientific, and uh, I, I just got to assume that this is, this is peer reviewed, so you know it's good. All right, New York Post article, why your swipes on Hinge and OK Cupid might be racist. Probably didn't even realize that your penis is racist. There's a new book out. It's by academics. It's called The Dating Divide, Race and Desire in the Era of Online Romance. And these three academics show how online dating sites exacerbate racial divisions. I, I thought online dating would bring people together. But no, race-related preference filters on digital dating platforms help foster racist attitudes, especially toward black women. Now, I, I read about the, the porn industry for over a decade, and uh, as part of my research, I realized that uh, many prostitutes in, in, in their ads say, no black men. Like I call upon whoever's going to be the attorney general, Merrick Garland. Why Merrick Garland right now is sitting before the United States Senate for a confirmation hearing, but no one is asking him about the civil rights issue of our time. Why, why isn't Senator Ted Cruz, why aren't the Republicans bombarding Merrick Garland with this, this gaping civil rights wound in our nation's psyche that so many of the finest, hardest, most exciting prostitutes say no black men. They feel like black men have bigger dongs. They feel like black men are more likely to be violent and criminal. They feel like black men are more likely to give them STDs. They, they, they feel like, oh, just because a lot of their sisters have had negative experiences with black men, that somehow that makes discrimination okay. That, that it's, it's okay for the higher end prostitutes to say no black men. Like, how is this acceptable? Where is our civil rights division of the Justice Department? Why is not anyone bringing this up to Merrick Garland? How can we have an attorney general who refuses to talk about the civil rights issue of our time? Why do we have this wall of silence up? Why, why is it not socially acceptable to talk about all the hawkers who refuse to service black men? How long are we going to maintain this wall of silence? How long, oh Lord? Like, I dream one day, you know, black men will have equal access to the finest, you know, non-black prostitutes, where, where black men who are Johns will not be judged by the color of their skin, but by the content of their character. Like, just, just because a black John has black skin, really, you're going to say that, oh, he's more likely to have STDs? You're going to say, oh, he's more likely to be, be big down there and therefore he's going to hurt me. Are you going to really claim that he's more likely to be criminally inclined and violent? Right? Enough already. All right? We can no longer judge Johns by the color of their skin. We must instead judge them by the content of their character. Like so many black men, you're wondering why they're violent? Well, they're violent because these uptight you know, higher end escorts of many different races just refuse to have sex with them. It, it's the Shonda. It, it's, I mean, filtering out people based on race is a normal practice on dating apps. And I think it's time we may make it illegal because there are just way too many penises out there and way too many vaginas out there that are racist. And we've just been turning a blind eye. Like we just walk down the street and we pretend not to notice you know, there's a black penis, you know, there's a, you know, there's a racist vagina, there's a racist penis. We just pretend not to notice, you know, we pretend that it's okay to have racial preferences when it comes to love and sex and marriage and, and dating. Racism, guys, it is literally built into the structure of these dating apps. Like, 
in any other sphere of life, the idea of having racial preferences is completely unacceptable. It's illegal. Why is it legal to have racial preferences about where you put your penis? I don't get that. Why are people allowed to racially discriminate when it comes to their PP? Why, why are people allowed to racially discriminate when it comes to their vagina? Why is this okay? How is this not illegal? And, and you know who's suffering? Black women. Black women have a much harder time matching on dating apps as do black and Asian men. Most people apparently prefer to date within their own race. How is that acceptable? How is that even legal? So black women in particular, they are subject to more exclusion and rejection than white, Latina, and Asians, female daters. Black women are the most likely of all races of women to be excluded from searches. Black women are also the most likely recipients of offensive messages. So discrimination is just part of the algorithms of mainstream dating apps and websites. I'm not talking about, you know, the Daily Stormer dating app. I'm not talking about the, the American Renaissance dating app. I'm not talking about some kind of VDare dating app. I'm talking about the big ones, the mainstream ones. There's this idea that many people have that it's okay that, oh, I prefer this race of people and I don't like this race of people for my sexual and romantic interests. Hinge. Okay, Cupid, plenty of fish, match.com. They all offer race and ethnicity filters. Tinder and Bumble do not. How is this okay? How is this legal? How, how do people not feel ashamed for having a racist penis? Like, oh, you know, up here, I'm not racist, right? No, up here, I, I'm Beverly Hills, but down here, I'm Compton. Like, down here, I'm racist. I, I mean, Filtering for race lets people feel free to express their biases and their racial misogyny toward women of color in a way that they typically wouldn't do in a face-to-face -face encounter. And so how do these black women, how do they go from, from being ignored to being harassed? Right, so the average dating app user doesn't see black women because of the filters they've set. So those who do see black women... You know why they're doing it? Because they've got a fetish. They're just fetishizing black women. They're just objectifying black women. They have their fantasies of black women. They want to play, you know, slave master and slave girl with black women. Now, why is it okay to objectify women? How is that all right? We got Nicole, lovely 39-year-old Afro-Caribbean here in the New York Post article. She's a single mother from Brooklyn, and she keeps receiving overly sexual over overtures from non-black men on apps. And this has become an unwelcome norm. Now, right off the bat, these guys are approaching her with, hey, sexy chocolate, or I love your beautiful black body. Can you twerk? Right? She's a registered nurse. How is this acceptable? Why is this okay? Nicole and other black daters, they routinely endure racist attitudes. I mean, these... These women are trying to use these dating apps to find meaningful relationships. And these men are just treating black women like sex objects. So one, it's not okay to not treat women like black women like sex objects. And number two, it's not okay to treat black women like sex objects. So you should neither treat black women as sex objects or refuse to consider them as sex objects. Both should be illegal. A lot of black women... They have to contend with all sorts of racist stereotypes, such as, oh, she's black, so she must be a sexually insatiable Jezebel. I mean, that, that kind of stereotype has its roots in slavery. And then there's the stereotype of the angry black woman. Like, there's this widespread belief that, like, black women are innately unruly and ill-tempered. I mean, we're talking here educated refined black women who are thriving in their careers. They're looking for comparable partners, but there's this complete disconnect between who they are in real life versus the Jezebel stereotype that they're subjected to online. There's Mish, a, a black executive assistant. 
told the New York Post that her digital quest for companionship reaped reaped a paltry handful of bad love connections. She's 53. Why should why should this 53-year-old black woman secretary not be overwhelmed by dudes who, who want to date her? She's feeling very turned off by dating sites right now. They're making her feel uneasy. Like, I'm not being seen as the beautiful queen I am. That is a direct quote from this New York Post article. She recalls one relationship with a Hispanic man that quickly turned sour. When we first met, he made a point of telling me how much he loved black women, that he was sexually aggressive during their first in-person meetup last year. So sexual aggression is just really the same as racism because you've objectified people and you, you've, 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 you don't understand their totality. You just want to get off, get up, get off, get in. No, get up, get in, get off. And, and then when he finally engaged in consensual sex with her, he, he ghosted her. Then she found out this guy, this bloke, he had a long sordid history of fetishizing black women for his personal pleasure, then dumping them once he'd had his fun. I, I know a bloke, a friend of a friend, he, he got divorced, like successful Jewish guy in his 30s. He did nothing but date black women for a year. But date is, I'm using euphemisms here. He just plowed a furrow through 50 different black women in a year. He just used them for his own pleasure. He just humped them and pumped them and dumped them. Why is this okay? How come this isn't illegal? Like this Hispanic guy, he targeted black women because black women are seen as sexual objects, right? I, I don't know about you, but pretty much every bloke I talk to, I say, you know, picture a sexual object and they always come up with like black woman, right? And, and so... So many guys are just targeting black women because they're seen purely as sexual objects and nothing more. Then what about black gay men? Black gay men, so they're subjected to hypersexualized stereotypes. You know, Clark is a 26-year-old urban contemporary choreographer. And he told the New York Post that his brush with racism ultimately got him banned from a leading date app. At first, this white guy was sweet, the Manhattan-based dancer explained, but after a few messages, he asked for nude pictures to see if the rumors about black guys are true. How is this acceptable? This is, guys, this is no way to conduct yourself on Grindr, right? You don't just send a few messages and then ask for nude pictures. Completely unacceptable. Then Clark responded to the request with a flurry of expletives, and then the guy who asked for the nude pictures responded, you know, reported Clark to the app administrators for cyberbullying, and he got banned from, from Grindr, I assume. He had to create a, a whole new account. He, he got attacked twice, once by the white guy, and then once by the white supremacists who run the dating app. So it's time that we do away with racial filters on dating apps to eliminate the perpetuation of racial stereotyping and discrimination. But they want you to know they are not bashing people for having a dating type. We're not dumping it on people's individual choices. We just want everyone to be aware of the longstanding societal issues being exacerbated on these online dating platforms. So many racist penises out there. It's frightening. Only white, not only would be associated as white or would consider herself white, but is essentially white passing. So therefore, even if I was not hypothetically white, I could rake in a certain white privilege that, for example, or a, a black or Latino person couldn't. This is what I've called the intersectional shakedown. Yeah. And the, the populations that are maximally irritating to the inter uh, intersectional shakedown artists are the populations with recent claims to oppression that are nevertheless making it economically. Because really what it is is an attempt to take a real history of oppression mm -hmm. and to turn it into cash. Yes, well, I tweeted literally today moments before I um, came here that the kind of idea of cultural pro appropriation, that debate makes perfect sense in a, a culture where uh, identity is viewed as a form of capital. Because it becomes in a zero sum game. If somebody like uh, Rachel Dolezal, right, right. Uh, perpetuates this myth that she's a black woman, she is basically taking food out of the mouth, power out of the hands of an actually black woman. Right. So there's that absurdity. But then we actually have to contend with the weird aspect, for example, if you look at the exploitation of black musicians, mm -hmm. who very often, you know, at some point you had a lot of uh, illiterate um, genius musicians in the Delta who were mm -hmm. brilliant enough to produce great music, but weren't capable of defending themselves in a legal structure. Right. Exactly. And so you actually had cultural exploitation of one group by another through appropriation. So you'd get, you know, I think at some point I saw Otis Blackwell performing in New York City mm -hmm. and, you know, he had to say, look, I'm the guy behind Elvis Presley. Right. And the idea is that when Elvis sang it, it was acceptable to a market that he couldn't sell into. Uh -huh. So 
there is a real aspect to cultural appropriation and there's a totally fake aspect, yes, which is yeah. this sort of, and they're coexisting. And so it's I very think... tempting for people like us just to point at the bullshit. Yes. But there actually is this unfortunate reality that's braided with it. Yeah, absolutely. No pun intended. Um, sorry. Oh, braided? Uh, braided. The box braids. Um, no, but it's it's uh, absolutely true. I mean, you can give the example of like Hesh and the Sopranos, right? We talked about the Sopranos at our power lunch. Um, who's a, this guy who's kind of this like kindly, sensible Jewish grandfather. Within a mafia context. Within a mafia context. Was warm, so warm and loving and steadily. And this is a guy who has historically stiffed black musicians for royalties, right? And there's that famous reparations episode with, uh, I think it was Bokeem Woodbine playing the, the rapper Mini Gark guy. And there's a question about whether he's going to visit violence upon him, but it turns out he's going to visit a lawsuit. Yes, yeah, 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 exactly. But then you have like these. Um, cultural examples of like, you know, like Katy Perry or uh, uh, Miley Cyrus wearing cornrows, like Kim Kardashian wearing cornrows in a um, Kardashian like beauty photo shoot, which I find completely preposterous. No one owns cornrows. I don't know enough about well, nobody, female hairstyle. There's no direct line of monetization, right? Okay. I don't see it that way. And so that that's a, a discourse that I think, yeah, you're right, exists as like a proxy discourse because people are afraid to confront the deeper, more complex issues. Well, I think that and you have one set of legitimate issues acting as the stalking horse for this uh, yeah. infernal shakedown. My, my hatred of this comes from the fact that if, if American Jews who have made it financially yeah. in one generation are somehow safe and secure and therefore privileged, mm -hmm. something is entirely broken with your kind of Eric Weinstein mm -hmm. here. What do you mean? Well, it's just like, I assume that the German Jews in the, you know, before Kristall, the, the two nights before Kristallnacht were privileged yes, and should be yeah. worried about their privilege. It's just, this is stupid. Yeah, it's a silly argument. And I think, you know, I get into spats about this and I'm, I'm frequently accused of like being racially insensitive. And I, you know, as Quentin, the late great Quentin Tarantino said, I reject that hypothesis. It's patently false. What I've always said is not, I'm not in the business. I'm not interested in having an oppression Olympics and saying like, well, okay, look, I come from uh, a historically oppressed background on two sides, but yeah, I, you know, grew up in a well, I, public I middle class milieu and, you know, but I'm going to use this kind of identitarian card. I'm going to play the card to be oppressed. That's not at all what I'm interested in. Um, what I'm saying is that as a person who comes from a, a different culture, I can view the legacy of American slavery at a critical distance in a way that American people may not be able to. Right. Because in, in Russia, you have a parallel system called serfdom. Right. These, the slaves and the serfs were emancipated within, I think, well, a year of each other. Right. But I mean, I just had uh, J.D. Vance in your chair. Uh -huh. uh, I've heard only horrible things about him. Oh, yeah. I'll introduce you. I yeah. like him quite a bit. Um, he, you know, his family, of course, is coming from Appalachia uh -huh. and hillbillies were de facto enslaved. Okay, so many racist penises right now watching this show. So let me talk to you heart to heart. Holly says, my mother told me if I date a non-white man, I'm more likely to get beat up by him. Was she wrong statistically? Yes, if you date an Asian man, I would say you are statistically speaking much less likely to get beaten up by him. I don't know how to do dating apps. I've tried a few times since the late 90s, but people on there freak me out. Well, that's because they're racist. Okay, Steve Saylor writes for National Review, is love colorblind? While interracial marriage is increasingly accepted by whites, surprising number of Asian men and black women are bitterly opposed. Why? This was published in 1997, so just three decades ago, Thorgood Marshall was only months away from appointment to the Supreme Court, and he suffered an indignity that today seems just not just outrageous, but almost incomprehensible. He and his wife had found their dream house in a Virginia suburb of Washington, D.C., but they could not lawfully live together in that state. He was black and she was Asian. Fortunately for the Marshalls, in January 1967, the Supreme Court struck down the anti-interracial marriage laws in Virginia and 18 other states. And in 1967, these laws were not mere leftover scraps from an extinct era. Two years before, at the crest of the Civil Rights Revolution, a Gallup poll found that 72% of Southern whites and 42% of Northern whites still wanted to ban interracial marriage. Uh, maybe a form of light slavery, if you will, just mm -hmm. served them as a different form of enslavement. Mm -hmm. um, with company towns, company script, company stores, company housing, private armies of detective agencies. Mm -hmm. So, you know, the idea that that is seen through the lens of white privilege shows you the mental impoverishment of the current woke ideology. Mm -hmm. And my claim is that we, we cannot afford to dispute it. We must ignore it just because it, it sort of shouldn't qualify intellectually. Like it didn't make... Uh, I mean, as, as uh, George Bush II said, don't negotiate with terrorists. And this is, I think, my big opposition to it is that woke ideology, by and large, is an, emo is, um, an, emo like an emotional hostage situation. It really is. It's a it's a hostage crisis. Yeah. Well, you, you, seem to not, you seem to be ignoring the credible threat to your reputation. In fact, it's making your reputation. Yeah, but so you're metabolizing this kind of uh, weird resentment and hatred um, that people are experiencing through fear because these are reputational attacks. So in general, they're attacks that say, I'm going to make it impossible for you to earn a normal living by, by making an attack on your reputation, which you need to negotiate okay. the institutional world. Yeah, and it's... Okay, back to Steve Saylor here. So let's fast forward to the present. Another black Asian couple, retired Green Beret Lieutenant Colonel Eldrick Wood Sr. and his Thai-born wife, Cortida. They were not hounded by the police, just by journalists desperate to write more adulatory articles about how well they raised their son, Tiger. The colossal popularity of young Tiger Woods 
and the homage paid his parents, a remarkable evidence of white Americans' change in attitude toward what they formerly denounced as miscegenation. Tiger's famously mixed ancestry, besides being black and Thai, he's also a Chinese, white, and American Indian, not merely tolerated by golf fans, many more than a few envisioned Tiger as a shining symbol of what America could become in a post-racial age. Interracial marriage is growing steadily. We're overcoming our racist penises, guys. From the 1960 to the 1990 census, white Asian married couples increased tenfold, black white couples quadrupled. Reasons are obvious, greater integration and the decline of white racism. While subtly interracial marriages are increasingly recognized as epitomizing what our society values most in a marriage, the triumph of true love over convenience and prudence. Nor is it surprising that white Asian marriages outnumber black white marriages. Social distance between whites and Asians is now far smaller than the social distance between blacks and whites. What's fascinating is that in recent years, a startling number of non-whites, especially Asian men and black women, have become bitterly opposed to intermarriage. Who, what kind of sick person doesn't celebrate racial intermarriage? Probably the most disastrous mistake Marsha Clark made in prosecuting O.J. Sim Simpson was to complacently allow Johnny Cochran to pack the jury with black women. As a feminist, Mrs. Clark smugly assumed that all female jurors would identify with Nicole Simpson. She ignored pretrial research indicating that black women tended to see poor Nicole as the enemy, one of those beautiful blondes who steal successful black men from their black first wives and then deserve what they get. So the heart of the problem for Asian men and for black women is that intermarriage does not treat every sex-race combination equally. On average, it has offered black men and Asian women new opportunities for finding mates among whites, while exposing Asian men and black women to new competition from whites. The 1990 census, 72% of black-white couples consist of a black husband and a white wife. In contrast, white Asian pairs showed the reverse. 72% consisted of a white husband and an Asian wife. It's like, you know, it's Jordan Peterson famously said, like, I figured out a way to monetize the SJWs. And, you know, you could possibly say that about Red Scare, but the, it's not kind of... No, I think you guys are doing something much more bizarre. And yeah, yeah, I agree. But it's not intended in that way. But that that was never the premise or the interest. It was kind of this earnest, it was truly kind of an earnest frustration with liberal mainstream feminism and liberalism. I don't even know whether it's liberalism. I mean, like, everything is so watered down and, and metastatic and bizarre. Yeah. That it's the vague whiff of the left gone mad. Yeah. Right, like it's not liberal. It's not progressive. We don't even know what it is. It just sort of technically yeah, resides to the left. Conservative, either, right? No. You can't rightfully call it that. Um, self hatred is obviously a very large part of it. I think, I, yeah, self hatred. I mean, this is another kind of, you know, I repeat myself loudly and often. Um, well done. According to the advice of my hero Quentin Crisp, who said that that was kind of the way to be, make yourself memorable. And um, it, the problem with the left, and I'm talking about kind of primarily the online left, is that these are people who are thoroughly infected with the virus of the neoliberal ethos. They're completely, they play completely within the terms of the system. And, you know, it, this brings to bear a very important point that I also like to repeat loudly and often by the new left critic, Christopher Lash. Um, and I'm going to paraphrase it because I don't know it verbatim because my synapses have been uh, zapped by being too extremely online, you know. Um, but he said, like, hey, you know, all the kind of traditional uh, bedrocks, all the traditional values and institutions of liberal society. So I was talking to my friend Yoshi Yobiyashi, the stand-up comic, and he was raving about Anna Kashikian. Uh, she does this podcast called uh, Red Scare. So... She's the she's one of two women on this podcast. She's uh, half Jewish, half Armenian, and uh, he's been listening to all of her podcasts. Okay, let's get back to Steve Saylor here, writing an essay: "Is Love Colorblind?" Part of the problem for Asian men and Black women is that intermarriage does not treat every sexual racial combination equally. On average, it has offered Black men and Asian women new opportunities for finding mates while exposing Asian men and black women to new competition from whites. Sexual relations outside of marriage, less fettered by issues of family approval and long-term practicality, they appear to be even more skewed. 1992 Sex in America study found that 10 times more single white women than single white men reported that their most recent sex partner was black. Wow, 10 times more single white women and single white men reported that their most recent sex partner was black. Few whites comprehend the growing impact on minorities of these interracial husband-wife disparities. One reason is that the effect on whites has been balanced. Although white women hunting for husbands suffer more competition from Asian women, they also enjoy increased access to black men. 
The weight of numbers dilutes the effect on whites. In 1990, 1 1.46 million Asian women were married, compared to only 1.26 million Asian men. The net drain of 0.20, so 200,000 white husbands into marriages to Asian women, is too small to be noticed by the 75 million white women, except in Los Angeles and a few other cities with large Asian populations and high rates of intermarriage. Yet this 200,000 shortage of Asian wives leaves a high proportion of frustrated Asian bachelors in its wake. Black women's resentment of intermarriage is now a staple of daytime talk shows, hit movies like Waiting to Exhale, magazine articles. Black novelist B.B. Moore Campbell described her and her table mate's reactions upon seeing a black actor enter a restaurant with a blonde. In unison, we moaned, we groaned, we rolled our eyes heavenward. Then we all shook our heads as we lamented for the 10,000th time the perfidy of black men and cursed trespassing white women who dare to take our men. Like most guys, Asian men are reticent about admitting any frustrations in the mating game, but anger over intermarriage is visible on internet online discussion groups for young Asians, the men featuring an even greater than normal for the internet concentration of cranky bachelors accuse the women of racism for dating white guys. And then we, of course, had uh, Elliot Roger go postal. For example, this dating disparity is a manifestation of a silent conspiracy by the racist white society and self-hating self Asian women to affect the genocide of Asian Americans. The women retort that the men are racist and sexist for getting sore about it. All they can agree upon is that media stereotypes and low self-esteem must somehow be at fault. Now let's review other facts about intermarriage and how they violate conventional social theories. One, you would normally expect more black women than black men to marry whites because far more black women are in daily contact with whites. First, among blacks aged 20 to 39, there are about 10% more women than men alive. Another tenth of the black men in these prime marrying years are locked out of the marriage market because they are locked up in prison. Maybe twice that number are on probation or parole. So there may be nearly 14 young black women for every 10 young black men who are alive and unentangled with the law. Black women are far more prevalent than black men in universities by 80% in grad schools, in corporate offices, and in other places where members of the bourgeoisie, black and white, meet their mates. Now, despite all these Opportunities to meet white men. Many middle-class black women have trouble landing satisfactory husbands that they've made Terry waiting to ex exhale Macmillan, author of novels specifically about and for them into a best-selling brand name. Probably the most popular romance vice regularly offered to affluent black women of a certain age is to find true love in the brawny arms of a younger black man. Both Miss McMillan's 1996 bestseller, How Stella Got Her Groove Back, and the most celebrated of all books by black women, Zora Neale Hurston's 1937 classic, Their Eyes Were Watching God, are romance novels about well-to-do older women and somewhat dangerous young men. As Miss Hurston herself learned at age 49, when she briefly married a 23-year-old gym coach, that seldom works out in real life. Two, much more practical sounding advice would be, since there are so many unmarried Asian men and so many unmarried black women, perhaps they should find solace for their loneliness by marrying each other. Yet, when was the last time you saw an Asian man and a black woman together? I don't think I've ever seen that. Black men, Asian woman couples are quite unusual, but Asian man, black woman pairings are incomparably more rare. And we've got similar patterns appearing in other contexts. Within races, blacks tend to most ardently pursue lighter-skinned, longer-haired black women. For example, Spike Lee's school days. Yet black women today do not generally prefer fairer men. In Britain, 40% of black men are married to or living with a white woman, versus only 21% of black women married to or living with a white man. Then in art, we have Madame Butterfly, a white man, Asian woman tragedy been packing them in for a century recently under the name Miss Saigon. The greatest black man, white woman story, Othello, has been an endless hit in both Shakespeare and Verdi's versions. So theatre always repeats itself first as tragedy, then as opera, and finally as farce, as seen in that recent smash, O.J. the Boar of Brentwood. Maybe Shakespeare did know a thing or two about humanity. America's leading portrayer of Othello, James Earl Jones has twice fallen in love with and married the white actress playing opposite him 
as Desdemona. Um, we're talking about monogamy, marriage, uh, the gender binary, um, any number of other kind of traditional values have already been, been dealt a serious blow by advanced capitals itself long before the social justice activists got their hands on them, before they mounted a fight against them. And that's a very important point to remember. So the way I see it, and, and you'll let me know if this dovetails or in fact conflicts or maybe just mm -hmm. total miss, is that the family and the religion mm -hmm. or culture mm -hmm. provide many of the same things that the market provides, like let's say an insurance policy. Mm -hmm. right? So for example, um, if you're trying to smooth your income stream over a lifetime and you have recessions, a family might take in some members who are out of work and right. put them to work in portions of the family business that are still functioning or work inside the home mm -hmm. um, in a way that sort of socializes some of the risk. And at the same time, you might buy some kind of a, a policy to try to smooth things out, you know, or you'll, or you'll try to save uh, in an institutional context. As these things conflict, um, the market has denatured some of these older structures. When people talk about American families are weak, mm -hmm. what they usually mean is, is that American markets have been regular and strong enough mm -hmm. that people have leaned less on the mm -hmm. pathologies of their mishpucha mm -hmm. uh, in order to try to get cleaner expressions within the market for, mm -hmm. for their various needs. Like instead of having you know a mother uh, come and be with a child when a new baby is born. Do your laundry. Yeah. What? Yeah, to yeah. Do your laundry. that you hire somebody to do it. Mm -hmm. And the idea is that the market is working in some sense. Yeah. The family starts to fall apart because you don't need it. Right, exactly, yeah. And you know, people are smart. They know that like seven, eight years of psychoanalysis is a very tall price to pay for having your mother come every week and do your laundry. It's an interesting and they'd rather be, yeah. Um, and there's this, you know, whole rhetoric now about a work-life balance, whatever. And I think that the, the, the market, part of the kind of psycho, let's say, like the psychological anima of the market is that it provides people, yeah, with a, a scaffolding and, and infrastructure through which to relieve themselves of their family. Right. So one of the... Um... One of the things that's interesting to me is, is that you're coming from a background which is very familiar to me where you have a Jewish Armenian uh, parentage and your father was a famous mathematician working in linear programming, mm -hmm. sort of optimization mm -hmm. science, and came up with um, this amazing algorithm that changed our picture for how things could be optimized using smaller and smaller ellipsoids. Right. And your mom, how did she figure into the story? Um, I, I, my, my dad, his whole kind of uh, level of achievement is way over my head, obviously. Um, but uh, my, my mom and my dad, I mean, they met when they were very young. They got married quite a bit later. My mom, I think, uh, would probably be very irate and disappointed if I described her like this, because, you know, she's going to listen to this. Um, she is an artist but I, who became a housewife, basically. Okay. And I think that she is the great genius of the family. She's the great kind of organizing and destructive force in my family. What's interesting, very often, um, in the, so I have to say that when we had this lunch, which you're describing as a power lunch, yeah, yeah. I drank no alcohol, but yeah. I'm not positive that it qualified. Well, I, I mean, are you supposed to drink? I don't really know. Okay. It would be my first power lunch. Oh, right. I have to, it's just, you know, a stupid uh, girl bossy hyperbolic term. I have I to, I have to drink. Okay. Well, very and good. And smoke at all lunches. I didn't smoke. You didn't smoke. But I'm such a neurotic. I'm so shy. I was telling you that I can't, you know, I have to constantly occupy. Uh, Is that because you're life. reveling in your neuroticism? No, no, no. I'm not like a Woody Allen person. I don't okay. get off on it. Oh, you sure? It's something that I hope to, to shed with a, okay. a, a, the kind of accumulation of experience, like habituation. Okay. Yeah. That's not something I think you should look up to in yourself. I don't know. Um, but yeah, I think that uh, my mom is kind of like a bizarre, freewheeling artistic genius, um, a true eccentric, and I think that I derive a lot of my personality and my tendency toward critique from her. I mean, she's always spinning paranoid polemics about the world. It's really quite impressive, and she's right most of the time. I think it's very strange that, I mean, this really actually echoes your earlier point, that we tend to see accomplishment only if it shows up in the workplace. Mm -hmm. And for a lot of us coming from kind of ethnic families, for lack of a better word, very often people who were inside the home were well known to be the local genius, mm -hmm. or the eccentric of the life or the whatever. Mm -hmm. It was not clear in any way that uh, if you were the Shimada salesman, that that was really the higher expression mm -hmm. of the two people in a marriage. Mm -hmm. And it happens that your father did something very creative yes. in a very analytic context. Yeah, it's yeah. hardly surprising. Like there's nothing at all surprising to me that your mom might mostly be at home with the family and be the major force of the family. Yeah, and I think like you know my, my dad probably gets all the credit for um, be, <laughs> uh, being kind of the genius. Um, my haters like to point out that I'm coasting off of my father's accomplishments, which is not true because I'm actually way more famous than him on Reddit. So there it is. Yeah, there you go. Um, <laughs> he would be so, uh, I, I'm here to disgrace my family name. Um, but basically I, I think that it's a very interesting, this, this kind of old breakdown of my parents' marriage is a very instructive example of the way that women wield unofficial power through the domestic sphere. Again, it's like unofficial. Like, the language is even wrong to me. It's like, in what world do we not I guess the idea is that it's official if it shows up in Wikipedia and it's unofficial if it only shows up in family lore. I, I think it's official if you're getting officially compensated for it, right? Well, this yeah. is the issue of kin work that I would yeah. bring up, which is that I think that a lot of the um, wage gap work is extremely weak. And I want you to know that this, this show has facilitated race mixing. Viewers of this show of different racial backgrounds have gotten together and gotten to know each other in, in a very intense, explicit, and intimate way. So I, I'm helping bring the world together through radical radical love and inclusion and you're welcome you're absolutely welcome and i got more funky music yeah yeah get down white boy get down white boy everybody together now
All right, let's have a look at the chat. Showing off my great Seventh-day Adventist dancing there. Uh, Holly the lawyer says, Marsha Clark screwed up that OJ case at the picking of the jury. Student says, uh, I don't know any about anyone else. I just love touching black women's hair. Yep, absolutely. Same for me. I can't stop touching black women's hair. I've been arrested three times for doing that. Uh, Holly says, Marsha Clark failed to understand the hatred toward white women. I doubt the state had funds to hire a jury expert to advise. Well, I think they did, and she just ignored it. It didn't occur to Marsha Clark to hire a jury consultant. Christopher Darden should have had a clue. Grant says, I used to have a naked Asian dancer desktop plug-in, but I think it was a Trojan. Can't even imagine the viral load that I got. Yeah, good. Apricot Sky soundtracks. Which which is the shoegazy song? This is such intellectual preening. Tough to watch. Okay. Steve Saylor here. Civil rights revolution left husband-wife balances among interracial couples more unequal. Back in 1960, white husbands were seen in 50% of black-white couples. 